So welcome everyone, I'm very glad to see you here. Uh, louder, I prefer Richard Stites biennial lecture. Uh, and I am Michael David Fox. I just wanted to say a few words about the purpose and of the Stites lecture, which is to honor the life and uh, achievements of Richard Stites. And some of us have some very vivid memories of him. I found a piece of Stitesiana in my office, which was given to me by David Goldfrank, who could not be here. Uh, he found it in the Stites archive. It's a page rather crumpled of uh, Critica, the journal uh, letterhead from the year 2000, which is when the journal was started, and it, the, 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 it's a note from me to Richard. Um, it says, Dear Richard, here's the text we discussed by email. A brief assessment of its potential would be fine in this case. Needless to say, this is not the most vivid memory <laughs> of Richard. Um, the book that just came out by the German historian Karl Schwerbel, it's a magnum opus of 800 pages on Soviet civilization called the Sovietische Jahre of the Soviet century. It's a book about um, the people and places and material culture and spaces of Soviet civilization uh, that he's been working on for decades, and in the introduction it talks about those historians who do not, did not play a role in the specific publication, but were sort of inspirations for the, uh, his entire sort of course of his work, and he then goes on to, to recall Richard Stites, and he was only talking about Stites as an innovative historian, he was not talking about Stites the man, but I mentioned together life and achievements because both sides, of course, went together. We're cursed to live in extremely interesting times, um, to paraphrase the Chinese proverb that turns out to be apocryphal Chinese power, proverb, but Richard would have had irreverent and I think interesting things to say about our current predicament. Um, but as we carry on our teaching and scholarship, and perhaps take part in tomorrow's march, I was prompted to think about the symbolic meaning of our everyday activities. And then, of course, I recalled the old Soviet joke of two men walking down the street in Moscow, and one of them spits on the ground, and the other said, it's best not to speak about politics. <laughs> My point is that carrying on teaching and scholarship and research in the traditions, the best traditions of Richard Stites may perhaps signify more than we imagine. So here to introduce our third Stites lecturer is my friend and colleague, Abiel Rashford. It's, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure uh, to um, have the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, Hubertus Jan. Uh, my earliest memories of uh, when first hired at Georgetown in 1991 uh, are associated with, uh, uh, among other uh, good things, the, the, the circle of, of people, of colleagues and students uh, uh, around uh, Richard Stites, who were so warm and, uh, and, and welcoming and uh, where Jan was was sort of a, a central figure in that uh, in that circle. He just um, uh, recently finished his PhD uh, under Richard and uh, was hired, uh, I believe, as visiting assistant professor uh, here. So we had a, had a chance to be colleagues with, uh, with him for uh, for a year, and, and um, that was uh, an integral part of, uh, uh, of of a warm experience that, that for me set, set me on a very um, good path here. At, department at, at Georgetown. Um, and my only regret is that it's been uh, over two and a half decades since we've seen one another, which is um, uh, deeply disturbing on many levels. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to have uh, uh, broken the fast. And uh, uh, I've had the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, 
Professor Yan, who is uh, uh, got his PhD here, of course, in 1991, uh, and went on to um, do his habilitation, uh, which he successfully defended at uh, the Friedrich um, Maximilian University in uh, Erlangen uh, some uh, some years later, and. Uh, Hubertus uh, Jan's uh, dissertation under Sykes went on to uh, be published uh, with uh, Cornell University Press as Patriotic Culture in Russia during World War I uh, if back in uh, 1998. Uh, was it earlier? Oh, 95. 95, yeah, paperback edition in 98. Um, and, uh, and this was. Uh, a book that was particularly significant because it was one of the earliest, uh, it was among the earliest works uh, in the in recent decades to uh, take uh, Russia's World War I experience as a, sort of a significant, worthy topic in its own right uh, for scholarly study rather than uh, just viewed retrospectively as a, as a sort of prologue to uh, the, the Russian Revolution and, uh, and, and Civil War. And, and so, uh, it, it's on the shoulders of, of scholars of, uh, like uh, Dr. Yan that, uh, uh, and his cohort that the subsequent work uh, in that field, which continues to flourish, um, was, uh, was built. Uh, he uh, went on then to a successful career in, in Europe, first at Erlangen and then uh, at, uh, at Cambridge, where he uh, is now a reader in, uh, in history at uh, Fellow of uh, Clare College, uh, uh, Cambridge, uh, and uh, he has uh, gone on to publish uh, a, a book in uh, German about uh, the history of uh, begging and poverty in uh, Russia, which I uh, hope so will be translated uh, sooner rather than later uh, into, uh, into English and other languages. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he has some 36 articles and book chapters uh, over the course of his career, if I count it more or less uh, correctly. Uh, and uh, among uh, other notable publications is also, uh, apropos this uh, lecture named after Richard Stites, uh, the um, issue of the Journal of Popular Culture, uh, which came out in 1998 in honor of uh, his mentor, uh, and which um, Robert Young co-edited with James Van Gelder uh, under the title Birch's Bolsheviks and the Like of Popular Culture in, uh, in Russian History. Uh, his uh, current uh, uh, work has uh, led him, among other things, to uh, expand his uh, range of already impressive length, range of linguistic knowledge uh, as he's begun studying uh, Georgian and spending time in Georgia. Uh, uh, that Georgia, not this Georgia, obviously. Uh, and uh, this adds to an already impressive roster of languages, um, uh, which, uh, which includes, among others, uh, uh, the expected Russian, uh, Greek, and uh, French, but also Latin and ancient Greek. I do notice with some dismay that, that um, Dr. Yan's uh, knowledge of Old Church Slavonic uh, is, is more of a reading knowledge than colloquial. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you know we can't all be perfect. Uh, so uh, today's lecture is related to uh, Dr. Yan's uh, latest uh, work, which uh, is studying the aesthetics of empire in uh, in Russia. And uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Yan to the stage. Thanks, Michael, uh, for your kind words and uh, for inviting me uh, to come here. It's, uh, it's déjà vu massively, I must say. I mean, I haven't been here for decades now. I mean, and, and, and when I walked to Jewishtown, where I lived for about six or seven years, things have changed, but they haven't changed that much. Uh, but they appear to be smaller. I mean, it's some, when you get older, the places that you remember, they, they, they take on a different spatial uh, character. But anyway, uh, it's always good to be back. And uh, thank you all for, for coming here. Uh, before 
joined the Russian Tsars in the Caucasus, let me take you to some other mountainous region uh, south of Munich in Bavaria, where I'm originally from. This is the George Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Garmisch Partenkirchen, a joint US German education facility under the auspices of the respective defense departments. It promotes security cooperation in and beyond NATO, as well as strategic and defense studies. The teachers and the students are an international mixture of spooks, government officials, and military personnel, and there are quite a lot of guys in uniforms and with bus cards running around. In other words, this is not really a place where one would like to expect to bump into someone like Richard Stites. Yet it was here, in the Bavarian Alps, where Richard David Goldfriend, I think you as well, uh, and a few other Georgetown faculty members uh, were based in the early to mid 1980s. Teaching what was then called the Russian Area Studies Program, or RASP, I think it's called a series now. Since Garmisch was and still is a pretty but not really very exciting place, Richard and David on many occasions came up to Munich uh, for various cultural activities but also to visit. Uh, the famous watering holes of the Bavarian capital. And it was in Munich where I first met them, uh, to be precisely at the library of the Osteuropa Institute where I then used to work. Soon they invited me out to Garmisch, and in a local restaurant called the Mühlrado, Richard and I first talked about the possibility of doing a PhD at Georgetown. He was then in the middle of writing his revolutionary dreams, and to me, coming from a solid, but let's face it, rather uh, not overly stimulating, German academic background, the conversations about this book opened up completely new universes of scholarship to me and intellectual challenges. Before long, David had organized a fellowship for me and helped me move to Georgetown. In late August 1986, I flew to the United States for the very first time in my life, reading Chandler's Long Goodbye on the plane, arriving at JFK's TWA terminal just after a thunderstorm had caused a power outage and the breakdown of the air condition. As I was waiting for my connecting flight, I sat down at the bar at a gym gimlet and felt quite literally catapulted onto a new planet. A bit like Leonid from Bogdanov's science fiction on the Red Star, which Richard had just re-edited a year before. Richard became one of the main guides through this new planet, and he did this in an exemplary way. As his teaching assistant and graduate student, I learned more about Russia and for the matter about teaching than I could ever have imagined. I still have very strong memories how he started his first lecture series in modern Russia, uh, basically taking the whole class into a peasant hut and making us relive the daily routine of the inhabitants there, including grandma crawling down from the stove in the morning and chasing away the roaches. Because Richard taught that the way he lived, always fully immersing himself into the subject matter. And he took his role as a doctoral advisor very seriously. Indeed, he was much more than just an academic mentor. This was particularly evident during the many times he overlapped in Helsinki and in Russia. On my first major research trip to what was then still the Soviet Union, I traveled by boat from Germany to Finland and then on to Leningrad. And there, the peer in Helsinki, he was, donning his conspicuous fur hat, waiting for his graduate student, and, no doubt, the box of cameras without filters which I brought for him. <laughs> During my short stopover in Helsinki, I received the crash course in the use of the Slavonic Library there, which I'm still using today, and I was introduced to the regulars and the bartenders at the Seahorse and <coughs> at Urhus Pub, which then was real, uh, still a real dime depending on how market it as it is today. Now Richard's guidance beyond the walls of the Albert Tower continued in Russia, where we went native together many times, be it at restaurants, at the Estrada stages, in jazz clubs, or at my dissident friends' art exhibitions. Research and life, just as with Richard, became one and the same thing for me as well, and have remained like that to this very day. My educational journey that started at the Mühlrad in Garmisch ended officially here in Georgetown, out there, uh, in 1991 with my graduation. But of course, my friendship with Richard continued all the way until 2010. Indeed, he was supposed to give a talk at my seminar in Cambridge just a week before he died, but he had to cancel the trip as his life's journey was coming to an end.
Now let's move on to a completely different lot of travels. Russian rulers have been traveling through the land since the Middle Ages and for a variety of reasons. After sporadic trips in the 15th century, Moscow and Grand Princes began to travel more regularly on pilgrimages, processions, and extended hunting expeditions from the early 16th century onwards. Unlike military campaigns, which had specific strategic goals and which were successful, uh, inclu including crossing borders, these journeys served a number of purposes. They could claim newly acquired territory as part of the realm, and they provided demonstrations of the splendor of the ruler of the power of his entourage. They also helped to promote the image of the ruler as a spiritual leader through the foundation of churches and the patronage of monasteries. But Peregrine and Moscovite rulers hardly ever left the Russian heartland. According to Nancy Coleman, their concern seems to have been to, def to define a center by demonstrating the ruler and his entourage to the populace, by patronizing church institutions and distributing arts, <coughs> and by making contacts with the local elites. It was Peter the Great who eventually introduced a new kind of travel. His grand embassy had clearly an educational purpose. He took the young Tsar to Western Europe, where he picked up many of the ideas for his reforms. Although Peter traveled officially incognito, the Grand Embassy also added a foreign policy element to the journeys of Russian Tsars, which reflected absolutist notions of prestige and international projection of power. This was particularly evident in the many trips of Catherine the Great, which was supposed to present her as an enlightened monarch to the rest of Europe. Especially the famous Crimean journey of 1787 was meant to show off the newly acquired and allegedly flourishing territories of Nova Russia, and it was only fitting that at the occasion she was accompanied by several foreign ambassadors and also met the Austrian Emperor Joseph II, who in turn was coming to Camilla. Russia's increasing involvement in European politics and the numerous intermarriages between the Romanos and Western European royalty led to an increase in diplomatic visits and private family trips abroad in the 19th century. Alexander I famously spent lots of time at the Congress of Vienna and at various other conferences abroad, prompting the poet Alexander Bushy he wants to call him a despotic and a muddy despot, despotic nomad, uh, for which Putin, uh, <laughs> Putin should, but Pushkin was exiled to the Caucasus. Nicholas I traveled extensively within the empire and sent his son, the future Alexander II, on an eight-month long exploratory trip of the land in 1837, which took the young Tsar age all the way to Siberia. Since then, Russian rulers became increasingly visible beyond the confines of the capital. Their visibility was enhanced by various new media that propagated the myth of a union between the Tsar and the people, and their mobility was considerably increased with the onset of the railway age in the 1860s. The Caucasus became a popular destination for Russian rulers once the kingdom of Kharkli Kakheti had been annexed by the empire in 1801. However, traveling in this mountainous region in the early 19th century was still dangerous and logistically difficult. Only after the occupation of Imereti and Abkhazia in 1810 and the conquest of Yerevan in 1828 did it become safe enough for Tsars to visit. Nicholas I was the first to arrive in 1837. Alexander II visited altogether four times with his father in 1837 as heir to the throne on an educational trip in September and October 1850, as Tsar in September 1861, and again in September 1870. During the last trip, he was accompanied by his son, the future Alexander III, who returned as Tsar in September 1888, accompanied by his son, the future Nicholas II. Now, this last Romanov Tsar came back to the region during the First World War in November. Traveling in the Caucasus was quite different from traveling within Russia proper. This was a region with an ancient culture, an exotic natural environment, high mountains, and often treacherous roads, a multitude of ethnic groups, a variety of religions, and a long tradition of brigandry and hostage taking. Although technically conquered and annexed by Russia, this area was still perceived as foreign as Alexander Pushkin, an early visitor, once famously remarked. During a journey to Erzurum in eastern Turkey, 
which he undertook during the war between the Russian and Ottoman empires in 1829, he traveled along the banks of the river Terek, crossed the Caucasus, and for the first time in his life, set foot on foreign soil. As he confessed a few years later in his famous travel account, uh, Journey to Arzum, which is history of Arzum, it was with an inexplicable fear that he, left the, that he left Russia and he saw a foreign country. The border, in particular, puzzled him. He experienced it as something very mysterious. For despite having entered a foreign country, he nevertheless still remained in Russia. After all, this stretch of land had just been conquered by the Russian army. Now, we don't know what the Russian Tsars felt when they arrived. But they did, in fact, enter a place that was culturally very different from Russia. This meant that, to some extent, protocol and ceremonies had to be adjusted, had to take local conditions into consideration. After all, the Tsar's visit to the empire's borderlands was, above all, a communicative event. It was meant, on the one hand, to represent the empire and project its might beyond its frontiers. On the other hand, it was supposed to communicate the power and magnificence of the ruler to a population that had not been exposed to these kinds of imperial scenarios before. This could only be done successfully if one got the semiotics right. It was then not just bureaucratic red tape or laziness, but rather an awareness of the complexities of the situation when in early 1871, in preparation of Alexander II's visit, Baron Nikolai, the head of the office of the Viceroy, produced a detailed report about the measures taken during the visit of Nicholas I in 1837. Obviously, this journey of Nicholas had become the model that provided the blueprint for the protocols of later visits. Tsars came to the Caucasus in various ways, by boat across the Black Sea or the Caspian Sea, or over land by coach and later by train. They traveled through the region on various itineraries, usually in the fall, when the summer heat had receded and temperatures were more pleasant. The visit of Nicholas I started on the 20th of September 1837, when he arrived by boat from Crimea in Gelenjik, a small harbor near Ekaterinodar, which is today Krasnodar. He later sailed on to the port of Redutkale near Putin, traveled overland via Kutaisi and Surami to Borjomi, Achatsiche, Ejmiadzin, Yerevan, and Tiflis, as Tbilisi was then called in Russian. From Tiflis, he returned to Stavropol, uh, to Moscow, crossing the High Caucasus Ridge on horseback in icy and snowy conditions. It was an early winter, once of winter this year. Nicholas disembarking from a boat was not only a practical choice in terms of travel comfort, journey time, and logistics. It also added a colonial element to his arrival. Also, Russia was, in all accounts, a continental empire with land connecting its central parts and its imperial domains, including the Caucasus. Stepping off a boat could be seen as reminiscent of the arrivals of European rulers, conquistadors, and explorers in distant overseas colonies. It was part of the colonial aesthetic that Europeans had grown accustomed to through paintings, prints, and later lithographs since the 16th century. Of course, the Caucasus was not India or Africa, and the Black Sea was not an ocean. But stepping ashore appears as a much more distinct form of arrival in another place. It mentally distances the point of departure from that of arrival and presents a clear geographical marker which journeys over land really rarely provide. Presumably Pushkin would have had less ambiguous feelings had he stepped off a boat, rather than simply crossing a river and an administrative borderline. Indeed, when Tsars came to the Caucasus over land, as Nicholas II did in 1914, a distinct point of arrival is somewhat missing. The Tsar was almost certainly sound asleep when his train crossed the border into the Yekaterinodar administrative district, the gateway to the Caucasus, as it was called. This was quite different in terms of entry if compared to the landing of his great-grandfather in 1837, or the spectacular arrivals of Alexander II in 1871, and in particular of Alexander III in 1888. In terms of pomp and circumstance, the arrival of Alexander III 
was by far the most spectacular. On board of the large steamer Moskva here on the screen, <coughs> the Tsar, his wife, their sons Nicholas and Georgi, arrived in Batumi on the 25th of September at 10 o'clock in the morning. They were welcomed by hundreds of people shouting hooray and by salutes from all the other ships and the coastal artillery. <coughs> Next to the pier, a large pavilion had been erected by the city, decorated with precious Persian rocks. Here you see the pavilion and uh, Alexander uh, uniform here. From that pier, the imperial guests went in open coaches to a church where they were met by Grigori, the Bishop of Guria and Mingrelia. In his welcome address, he thanked God, that is the Bishop, that for the first time since the region had returned to Orthodox in the distance uh, 1878, people were able to see that Tsar's Savior in person. After the church service, the Tsar and his family drove onto a square, which is today the Boulevard of Batumi, for those of you who know the city. Uh, and in the central location, the cornerstone from Alexander Nevsky Cathedral was to be laid. After praying and kneeling down, Alexander and his family descended to the base of the future cathedral and with their own hands put bricks into the ground. Bishop Grigori gave a speech proclaiming that, quote, after some 200 years of suffering under the followers of the false prophet, thanks to the Russian Tsar, a miracle has occurred in this region. Where people have long suffered in poverty and ignorance, the benefits of enlightenment and accomplishment of Christianity have been planted. He used the word massage And the themes of planting and of touching the recently acquired ground, of bringing order and enlightenment to the place, continued after breakfast, when the Tsar and his family visited the new municipal garden. Its director explained that the garden had been founded only recently. The first trees and shrubs had been planted by local citizens, but soon foreign guests and visitors also brought plants uh, to this new garden. And at this point, the distinguished visitors expressed the wish to plant some trees themselves, which duly happened at a place which had been already prepared. Now, for the exotic setting of the Batumi coast, the Tsar and his family chose even more exotic plants. Alexander planted the Magnolia grandiflora, the king among the magnolias, which is, which is meant to symbolize mobility. You can see the magnolia here. This is the magnolia that now grown up. This was last September, so they're still alive, these trees. Uh, it's seen that Vanishvili, who likes to collect trees, hasn't noticed that yet to plant them. Uh, his wife, that is the Tsar's wife, planted a Himalaya cedar, which is on the left, a tall one, uh, which is considered a divine tree among Hindus. Nicholas planted a Chinese cypress tree and his brother a false holly, which in old Japan was understood to have magical powers. Planting trees is, of course, a deeply symbolic act. It is a performance of putting down roots and encouraging future growth. Gardening in general means the taming of nature, the ordering of wild growth, and the enhancement of beauty. But it also has a religious context starting with the Garden of Eden, of course. By literally getting his hands dirty when laying the cornerstone of the church and planting the tree, Alexander connected directly, but also, of course, figuratively, with the soil of his new territory. He took on the role of the good gardener from the Bible, who plants good seeds and sorts up the weeds. And nothing less was suggested by the last words of Bishop Grigori's speech, where he talked about planting the benefits of enlightenment and Christianity. In any case, it was obvious uh, to everyone that with the arrival of Alexander in Batumi, the empire and orthodoxy had put down solid roots in this region. Religious aspects played a major role in all the visits of the Tsars. Back in 1837, special arrangements had been made regarding the meeting uh, between the Tsar and the Catholicos of the Armenian Apostolic Church in Hbz. Since such a reception of a Russian Tsar had never happened before, the Catholicos was asked uh, to set a ceremonial based on the past meetings between the Catholicos and the head of state. And this ceremonial was then adopted during the visit of Nicholas. During later visits, meetings with high clergy of the various religious denominations, both Christian 
and Muslim were part of the standard repertoire and reflective of and indeed celebrating the multi ethnic nature of this part of the empire. However, a clear hierarchy of religions could also not be missed. Upon arrival in Tiflis, every Tsar, starting with Nicholas uh, in 1837, first visited the Exarch of Georgia in the Sioni Cathedral. This grandiose ceremonial entry into the city signified royal patronage and harmonious link between the monarchy and the Orthodox Church, like most of our times was retained even later when the Tsars arrived by train. Both Alexander III and Nicholas II went straight from the train station to the Sioni Cathedral. Here we have a photograph where you see Alexander III going into the church. Well, there's Alexander here. Because of the peculiar geopolitical location of the Caucasus, visits by Tsars always contained an international aspect as well. When Nicholas II visited in 1914, his arrival sent a clear message to the Ottoman Empire, which had attacked the Russian Empire just a few weeks earlier. But in more peaceful times, the Tsar visiting the Caucasus usually elicited courtesy visits by royalty or high-ranking envoys from the adjacent empires. In 1837, the heir to the Persian throne, Nasr al-Din, was sent to Yerevan to greet Nicholas. The Russian side was in charge of accommodation and the provisions for the trip, which included, among others, 15 rams, 60 chicken, and 15 liters of sour milk at each of the four places uh, where the prince and his entourage of some 200 people made a stop. The meeting with the Tsar was rather peculiar and full of symbolism. Nazar, I should add, was only six years old. Nicholas, a very tall, a uh, person lifted him up and put him on his knees. Then he gave him a precious ring, which he took from one of his fingers. And allegedly, he told Nazar that he should always remember that moment when he was sitting on the knees of the Russian Tsar. Now, less than 10 years after the Russo Persian War and the brutal murder of the Russian envoy Alexander Grigoryedov by a Tehran street mob, there was hardly a more ingenious way of demonstrating um, the um, the current power relationship in that region um, to the outside world. Now, later encounters between uh, Tsars and foreign delegations did not have such strong uh, symbolic overtones as this one. Uh, instead, they were rather more plain diplomatic uh, business embedded in the protocol uh, and part of the ceremonial display of a visit, more generally underlining friendly relations with the neighboring countries. So, there was not such a high ranking person coming as was the case in 37. Now, for many centuries, the Caucasus had been contested between various empires. And Donald Rayfield, of course, has, uh, spoke about Georgia as, as the, 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 the age of empires. Um, but that situation also meant that Russia's conquest of its strategic and political territory in the 19th century was a huge operation for its army. Lots of troops and some of the most famous guard regiments were stationed in the region. And they played prominent roles in all the visits of the Tsars. Parades, drills, salutes, and inspections of military camps and festive dinners with the officer corps were regular features. If the Tsar happened to be the commander-in-chief of a specific military unit, he was welcomed with even more pomp and splendor. Alexander II, for example, stopped at a huge military camp near Mtskheta, <coughs> which included his Yerevan Light Grenadier Regiment. He was first met by the staff officers, uh, and when he left the staff building, by that time he had changed and he was wearing uh, the uniform of the regiment, he was welcomed by the soldiers with many rounds of hooray before he inspected the line of troops. And during that occasion, he proclaimed his son to be the deputy commander-in-chief of the regiment, which again was met with lots of hooray, shots of hooray and so on. Now when the son returned as Alexander III in 1888, his Yerevan, like the Nadir regiment, provided the guard of honor. They also put, in a put on a parade in a camp near Tianete in the mountains of the north of Tiflis. Preceding that parade was a lunch during which the regiment's choir and orchestra performed until you have the menu for the lunch. To servings of akroshka, tomato soup, pirashki, fish in a speak, grouse cutlets, sirloin steaks with side dishes, and ice cream, they played a potpourri from Tannhauser 
Frühlingserwachen bei Leonhard Bach. Der Potbrief von Meyer wäre es Robert Le Diable am See bei Schubert. Endfinale of Welt ist Ermani. A festive dinner with 121 guests followed in the evening, which concluded with the Tsar and his family on a balcony, watching folkloric dances and listening to Georgian music playing national instruments and polyphonic songs performed by local Marmon residents. Like the design of this menu, which showed a mixture of Russian and Caucasian uniforms, the music was rather eclectic, with European and local fare on offer. Only the food was plain Russian, without any exotic dishes from the region. <coughs> Those would be served the following day, however, during a breakfast hosted by the nobilities of Signavi and Tilavi on a mountain pass near Tianeti. On this occasion, Alexander went fully native in terms of culinary experience. He was served chikirkma, a chicken soup with eggs and spices, mountain trout, veggie with kemali, with boiled beef shoulder with sour plum sauce, pheasant cloth, shashlik of black franklin, lobby with chili beans with onions and coriander and ground walnuts, and a fruit salad served in a watermelon. Now the menu of this meal, which is unfortunately not preserved anymore, was actually bilingual in Russian and in Georgian. It depicted vignettes of wineskins, drinking horns, wine jugs, and Georgian musical instruments. Other menus for dinners and lunches along the route of Alexander III provide further insights into the distinctive aesthetics of his visit. Their visual images convey meanings and various messages in addition to the information about the food that was served at the table. Although they were produced and printed in St. Petersburg, all of these menus display local Caucasian peculiarities and customs. With the exception of Alexander's monogram, hardly any of them made references to Russia or Russian style and traditions. They often featured the codes of arms of a place and specific local achievements, landmarks, ethnic dress, typical economic activities, or culinary specialties. The menu for the breakfast taking place on the Tsar steamer Moscow, which we had seen before, after his arrival in Batumi, showed plenty of fish briskly dashing around a sailing boat with Batumi, uh, with Batumi skyline, rather, uh, in the distance, uh, watched yearningly by a Russian sailor in a Caspar David Friedrich-like composition. Obviously, the abundance of indigenous marine life and Russia's, Russians' romantic attraction to southern shores were celebrated on this menu, while simultaneously real fried mullet was being served to Alexander as a local specialty, a fact that was proudly emphasized in the local newspaper, and of course, the original Kasper David Friedrich of the Segler is, uh, had been painted in 1819. It was actually in Hermitage. It is in Russia to this day. The menu of a gala dinner hosted by the Tsar for the local high society in Tiflis showed a view of the city, as you can see here, and the coats of arms of the Caucasian provinces. Tiflis as the capital in the middle, and then uh, to the right we have Dagestan and Baku, and to the left we have Rotok Kutaisi, uh, then Elizabeth Port, which is Ganja today, and Yerevan. All attached to this frame, which more looks like a Georgian church vestibule. Visible in the background is the old town with the Narikala forest, uh, the Metehi church, and Mount Kazbegi. So, the fortress here, the church, and then Kazbegi in the back. Symbolizing the wealth and prosperity of the city, a Georgian nobleman and a noblewoman in precious costumes are devoutly presenting a loaf of bread. They are followed by a merchant carrying wine in a traditional leather bag and a fruit seller proudly holding a plate overflowing with his wares. Because of the frame, it appears as if the scene is set on a stage and observed from the outside like a petrol. The latter would of course have been the perspective of Alexander, reviewing his Caucasian domains, while the former would underline the theatrical aspect of the visit, during which every local had to play the role they were assigned in the presence of the illustrious visitor. In this particular scenario, with this particular dinner, these locals were the 208 guests of the evening, all hand-picked and listed in the protocol with their professions and their wives' names. The dress code was, dress code was festive, with ladies having to wear hats and semi-low-cut shirts, short dresses, 
uh, sorry, officers their uniforms and civilian administrators their guard uniforms. Decorations were also to be worn. Bronze table decorations had been brought all the way from St. Petersburg. They included pineapples, the ultimate symbol of hospitality, prestige, and colonial prosperity that has been cherished by European royalty and nobility since the 17th century. <coughs> but the exoticism didn't stop there. At least for the locals, it continued when the food arrived. While many of them will have known the more typical Russian dishes, such as patrinia, cold soup with uh, red fish, uh, or a piroshki, very few, if any of them, will have been exposed before to such extravagant achievements of French old cuisine, like turtle soup or goose liver souffle with truffles. Sorry for torturing with all these recipes. <laughs> The menu that we have here was for a lunch in Kutaisi, and that one provides a veritable plethora of references. Alexander and his guests were sitting at tables decorated with, quote, living flowers, enjoying duck soup, fried mullet, beef loin, poulards with truffles and other delicacies. A closer perusal of the menu allowed them to contemplate various quotations from local history, folklore, flora, landscape, and agriculture. The crest of Kutaisi on the top left and the frieze next to it clearly refer to Jason and the Argonauts coming to Orchis in their quest for the Golden Fleece. The Roman helmet, dagger, and spear allude to the time when Western Georgia was part of the Roman Empire. Appropriately, they were embellished with the cherry roll, which is not only a native species of the region, but also the plant that provided the leaves for laurel wreaths in Roman times. The link with antiquity is complemented by a contemporary scene with the majestic mountains in the background, a charmingly ramshackle house with Georgian uh, Caucasian rocks draped on the balcony, uh, then in the right hand corner the uh, juicy grapes on the wine, and a group of Georgian men sitting on the ground and enjoying a super that is a typical Georgian meal, complete with clay jugs full of wine and music played on a tar, a lute which is made from mulberry wood, originally coming from Persia, uh, but popular throughout the South Caucasus. Quite different in style and message was the menu for a lunch with 60 guests in the palace of the governor of Baku province. Among those attending were army officers and civilians, including businessmen such as Emmanuel Nobel and other oil magnates. While the orchestra played a march from Tannhäuser, a waltz from Zigeunerbach by Johann Strauss, uh, a potpourri from Milliker's Petal Student and melodies from Tchaikovsky's Sneguruchka, Alexander and his guests were served Scottish broth, stirred with cucumbers, veal with side dishes, goose liver pate, and artichokes with truffles. In stark contrast to this cosmopolitan food and European music was the picture on the menu, which shows a group of Muslim dignitaries exiting the famous mausoleum of the Shirvan Shahs and humbly presenting the coat of arms of the city top by the imperial crown. To underline the orientalist motif of the scene, a camel is parked at the far end, while the background is more reminiscent of a desert in a sandstorm rather than the center of Baku, where the mausoleum is actually located. Now, menus for breakfast, lunches, and dinners were part of the many paraphernalia of a Tsar's journey. At first glance, they seem less important than more spectacular features, such as speeches, balls, ceremonies, or fireworks, because they were simply decorative accessories. But from a historian's point of view, they actually disclose information which adds more complexity and nuance to the overall interpretation of the Tsar's visits. Menus were not meant to shock or to make grand statements or reveal uh, state policies. They were there to give basic information and to please the guests through original and beautiful designs and illustrations that one could marvel at and talk about in polite conversation. This means that they reflected more or less intentionally contemporary ideas and aesthetic conventions which need to be assessed together with the other representation aspects of the visit. For example, while Alexander III did lay cornerstones for Alexander Nevsky cathedrals in Batumi and Baku, thereby emphasizing the Russianness of these places, the images and visual messages from the menus of his trip, with the emphasis on regional and local history and customs, and in one case even the Georgian language, 
call into question uh, Richard Woodman's contention that the 1888 visit, quote, put on display the theme of the national Russian character of the empire. <coughs> Indeed, while the Russianness of the empire was certainly one important aspect of Alexander's journey, its multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multilingual character was equally emphasized, and, on my part, even celebrated at the table. Now, the Tsar's visits were always carefully choreographed. They included visits to schools, museums, hospitals, orphanages, and similar charitable uh, institutions, receptions of religious leaders, meetings with representatives of various social ranks, ethnic groups, and municipal authorities. The logistic operations were immense, and lots of rules and regulations were issued in connection with the trips. Just to give you some more exotic uh, examples, to ensure a smooth progress of the journeys, <coughs> noise restrictions were put in place. Already in 1837, a decree was issued that church bells should not ring at night along the Tsar's route in order not to disturb his sleep. In 1888, this became even more specific. Hooray was not to be heard between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. in order not to annoy the illustrious guests, but in a nod to indigenous traditions and culture and also to the well-known musical interests of Alexander III, Caucasian folk music, Zimna Musica, was permissible in a certain distance with its hours passing through the streets and squares. Now, visits of Tsars and the Caucasus regularly led to local shortages in accommodation and to an increase in prices for goods and services, especially in Tiflis, which as the administrative religious and military center of the region was usually the high point of the journey. Already in 1837, princes, khans, and other honorable visitors from Dagestan and other Muslim areas were warned that they had to provide their own subsistence in the city, and that everything would be very expensive. In 1888, Tiflis almost came to a standstill. Already weeks before the arrival of Alexander and his family, buildings were repaired and decorated with flags, pennants, and greenery. The prices of builders, tailors, and goldsmiths skyrocketed, and the city was, quote, overflowing with court lackeys, moving here and there in their fire tongs, walking in groups up and down the Loving Prospect, and crowding into the shops, all well fed and with shaved physiognomies, as if Jenny Weidenbaum, a local government official, rightly noted in his diary. The building and decoration boom in the city was matched by roadworks and bridge repairs along the road. Added to this were numerous safety measures. Already in 1837, it was decreed that on quote, all dangerous places, such as bridges, ravines, or sharp turns, fires should be lit and people with torches should stand along the road. Similar arrangements had been made in 1871, when Alexander II was traveling by coach along the military highway, crossing the High Caucasus at over 2,300 meters above sea level. Because of the distance between the two places for the night, as Vladikavkaz in the north and Mleta in the south, it was inevitable that the convoy with the Tsar would have to make a steep descent from Budauri to Mleta after nightfall. Here you see the descent in a much better shape uh, more recently. Torches and fires by the roadside, it was argued, might frighten the horses on these narrow and steep serpentines. Instead, six people were assigned for each kilometer along the road with reflective lamps containing three staring candles each. Additionally, three such lamps were placed at each sharp turn. <coughs> This arrangement was rehearsed with all the horses and coachmen for five nights before the arrival of Alexander. Apart from breakfasts, lunches, and dinners hosted by the Tsar for the local dignitaries, the social highlight of the visits were always the balls or dinners organized for the august visitor by the nobility of the region. These events, more than anything else, were meant to symbolize the close ties between the Tsar and the local elites. They allowed for direct personal contact between the ruler and the subject, and they were consequently accompanied by a lot of jostling for places near the monarch. In 1837, almost 1,000 guests attended the nobility's ball in Tiflis, including all the leading Muslim clerics from the region and the rulers of Hungaria and Abkhazia. As a German observer, the Berlin botanist Karl Koch noted, most of the guests wore national costumes. The ladies' outfit were made of silk, gold, and precious stones. The men's were mostly oriental, with mullahs wearing long kaftans and pointed fur hats or flowery robes. The ball started at 7 o'clock. 
but Nicholas appeared only two hours later. He opened the event dancing the Polonaise with Princess Ketevan, the daughter of the late King Pilate II. After the dance, he was introduced to various people. And it appeared that some of the guests, particularly from the Muslim regions, were, quote, still ignorant of European customs, and according to Koch, quite robustly pushed their way towards Nicholas, quote, as if they were a bazaar. In another incident, one of the Muslim dignitaries, following the custom to wash hands and feet before eating, had a bowl of water and towels brought in by his servants, uh, sat down on the precious rug, and started to have his shoes removed, until, to his dismay, he was told uh, by one of the guards that this behavior would not be appropriate at such an occasion. Once the Tsar had left, the ball apparently became even more lively and exotic with one group of nobles continuing to dance European style in the main hall, while others went next door, unpacked local musical instruments, played Georgian tunes, and danced the Lesginka, the national dance, with, quote, such noise and thunder that one could not hear one's own voice anymore. End quote. Now, while Koch was obviously biased in his understandings of etiquette and ethnic difference, his description still provides interesting insights into the human and cultural interaction at the ball. There were clearly some misunderstandings with regard to the protocol, yet there were also mutual learning processes taking place. Nicholas was exposed to people from different cultures displaying some odd behavior, who in turn were confronted by European manners and rules. Those Georgian nobles who switched back and forth between European dance and the Lesginka were obviously already at ease in two cultures. They had bridged different national spheres and were able to operate on a range of cultural registers. This kind of hybrid identity of Georgian nobles was a feature which found expression during the balls of the nobility at later visits as well. In 1871, the ball of the nobility took the form of a festive lunch in the summer theater located in the old town of Tiflis next to the river. The hall was decorated with garlands of fresh roses, flower bouquets, and fragrant plants. It was illuminated by modern gaslight, as a newspaper proudly reported. Tables were set for 300 guests. Alexander arrived to the tune of a ceremonial march and was welcomed by the marshal of the nobility, Prince Zumbatov. After the last course, Zumbatov gave a speech referring to Alexander's visit in 1850, um, and uh, at that point, because the beach was still engulfed in war, and uh, Alexander at that point actually uh, met and heroically confronted a group of Chechens uh, in the North Caucasus. <coughs> now, Zumbatov then continued, there are only peaceful citizens around here, happy to see the monarch, who has pacified the region and given freedom to the serfs. The speech then ended with a toast to the Tsar, who was then presented with an antique silver azarpesha, which is a traditional Georgian drinking cup for wine with a long handle, uh, that was used during ceremonial occasions. When Alexander rose from the table, the curtains of the hall opened, and the park outside became visible. It was beautifully illuminated with a fountain and a pavilion in Eastern style, thus also for where the Tsar then took his evening tea. Now, compared to the 1837 ball and its gaps and cultural misunderstandings, the nobility's event in honor of Alexander II in 1871 appeared like a smooth and orderly occasion. Although local ethnic traditions and oriental styles were retained, they were well integrated into the festive evening and exhibited in much more refined ways in form of the Azar Pesha uh, and the illuminated oriental fountain pavilion in the park. The exotic, it appears, had become tamed and domesticated. Now the guests behaved in civilized fashion in a room with the latest lighting technology. Prince Zumbato's emphasis on Alexander's progressive achievements, the pacification of the Caucasus, and the abolition of serfdom were reflective of a general sense of modernity and progress, which now prevailed among, among an increasingly Europeanized nobility that had become a pillar of Russian rule in the region. The reign of Viceroy Michael Varontsov and his civilizing efforts, which lay between the visits of Nicholas I and Alexander II, had clearly had a major impact, both on the way the local elites saw themselves, but also on the way how they wanted to be seen by the outside world. As loyal servants of the empire, yet self-conscious and proud of their centuries-old Georgian tradition. 
This was strikingly evident in the ceremonial aspects and aesthetics of their feast, which on a much larger scale were put on display again during the visit of Alexander III. In 1888, planning started as early as April, so the visit was in September, but planning started in April, when the Marshal of the Nobility officially asked the Tiflis governor for permission to hold the ball for the Tsar. Already many weeks before the event, preparations were underway and rumors were rife about who would be invited to that ball. According to the ever acerbic Evgeny Weidenbaum, a retired beauty, Adstafna Krasavica, Countess Chilhaya, went as far as to take out a loan on her house in order to afford a proper dress for the ball, which eventually was attended by some 800 guests. The building of the Noble Assembly on Golovin Prospect was decorated in the most elaborate way by no one less than Pyotr Mikhailovich Shamshin, a famous artist and professor of the Imperial Academy of Art in St. Petersburg. Exotic plants, lemon <coughs> trees, and laurels, illuminated from below, lined the long red carpet at the entrance and gave the impression of a tropical forest. The walls of the staircase inside were covered with expensive oriental rugs, leading up to a landing which had been converted into an exquisite eastern pavilion with columns covered in greenery and flowers, and a cupola created from red silk bands illuminated by a Moorish lantern. From this pavilion, between two huge bronze figures holding two gigantic candelabras, one entered into the main ballroom, which featured three massive chandeliers, as well as light pink and light blue atlas cloth, draped around the doors and windows, exuding a, quote, Venetian flair. All other rooms were decorated in oriental style with lots of rugs, Caucasian daggers, and musical instruments embellishing the walls. People started arriving for the ball at 8 o'clock in the evening. Most noble ladies were wearing Georgian robes, and most of the men were donning national costumes, that is, gold embroidered velvet caftans lined with sable fur. Around 10 o'clock, Alexander and his wife arrived to the tune of God Save the Tsar. The ball opened with a polonaise, followed by a quadrille in which the Grand Dukes also participated. Alexander then retired to have fruits and tea, and after the wars returned to the ballroom where he chatted with many guests and watched the Lesginka, which he obviously enjoyed so much that it wanted, he wanted it to be replayed uh, several times. After two hours, the imperial family left, but the ball continued all the way into the morning hours. Now, apart from the intense human interaction in a hall packed with people, the affirmation of social status of the participants through obtaining an invitation, and the ostentatious display of close ties between the Tsar and the local elites, this ball was a veritable feast <coughs> for their eyes. The cornucopia of European, Georgian, and various Oriental styles, the exquisite decorations, expensive costumes, colorful fabrics, and exotic plants, reflected not only the material wealth, the natural beauty, and cultural diversity of the region, but also represented the multi-ethnic nature of the empire more generally. They brought to life what the aforementioned menus, which you have seen of those lunches and dinners, had depicted in a more delicate visual form. The mixture of cultures, styles, and aesthetics, evident in the nobility's events since 1837, manifested itself even more widely during popular feasts, which were put on for the urban population and which both figuratively and literally were meant to show the union between the Tsar and the people. The tradition of a Narodny Praznik as part of the visit of the Tsar to the Caucasus was first introduced by Alexander II. When he visited Western Georgia in 1861, a feast for the local population was planned in a suburban park in Kutaisi. However, a rainstorm led to the cancellation of the event, and much to the dismay of those who had wanted to attend. During Alexander II's Visited in 1871, however, the weather was more favorable. The feast took place in the Mushtaid Gardens, in the suburbs of Tbilisi, which is still there today. Uh, and according to the slightly hyperbolic description in the newspaper of Kafkas, the whole event was more like a fairy tale, like one of the best episodes from 1001 Nights. Masses of people were celebrating under trellises with wine and greenery. The balmy southern night was illuminated by millions of lights and colorful lampions hanging in the trees of the park. A pavilion in Moorish style was prepared for Alexander, where the Hamkari, that is the members of the local guilds, brought him fresh fruits and flowers. 
While this happened, floats on the Trari River were slowly passing by with brightly illuminated transparencies depicting scenes of peasant weddings according to Russian and Georgian styles. Now, this was obviously an allegory of the new quality of relationship between the two peoples. It turned what Richard Goldman has called Alexander's scenario of love, that is the romance between the monarch and the people, into a love match between Georgians and Russians. The evening culminated in a huge fireworks display which surpassed everyone's expectations with, quote, one presentation more grandiose and fantastic than the other. Now, feasts for the people were highly communicative events. They introduced new forms of pageantry to a wider audience and fused them with local traditions. They allowed ordinary people to bask in imperial splendor, at least for one evening, and to see the Tsar with their own eyes in a ceremony that also celebratory and slightly relaxed setting. As many of them were illiterate, this was the most straightforward way of imparting some sense of imperial community and of confirming paternalist values. At the same time, these feasts, like the nobility's balls, were also an occasion for the city elders and the lower orders to show off and to present themselves to the royal visitor. Their feasting in front of his eyes was, however, not entirely authentic or, for that matter, spontaneous. They rather played themselves as part of the genre of Narodin Brazil, which in turn was a constituent component of the protocol of a Tsar's visit. To what extent they were conscious of being a sort of folkloristic element, so that the Tsar meeting the people, uh, is hard to tell. It is also impossible to know which impressions individual people took home from the evenings and how they affected their views uh, of the empire, of the Tsar, or for that matter, of Russia. Based on the rather detailed newspaper descriptions, it is important to note how the concept of the union between Tsar and people in the context of the imperial borderlands was transposed into a new specifically ethnic aesthetic framework, which was characterized by the customs and traditions of the local people, the oriental style and the exquisite embellishments of the pavilions, the sights and sounds of the fireworks, the beauty of the illuminations in the park, the exoticism of the southern nights, and the lushness of the local fauna. And it is this image which was spread via the papers in Russia and abroad, and which thus became part of the official imperial scenario. The comprehensive involvement of ordinary people from different ethnic backgrounds in the visits of the Tsars allowed the paternalist traditions of the Russian monarchy to chime with age-old local practices of patronage. They allowed for what Ron Sun and Val Kibbelson have called the reciprocity between ruler and ruled. In this context, petitioning the Tsar became a common feature of every visit as well. This deeply symbolic communicative act was the closest kind of direct interaction that one could have. For the 1837 visit, the commander-in-chief of Imerati had tried to suppress petitioning because Imeratians in particular were allegedly prone to ask tricky questions and to complain profusely. Yet he was reproached for his initiative by the chief administrator of the Caucasus, Baron Rosen, who noted that the Tsar, when visiting the region, actually wanted to learn about the needs of people and to find out about their condition. So petitioning was thus permitted. Although by the time for Alexander III's visit in 1888, it was also strictly regulated. By then, people were allowed to hang in their petitions only between 8 and 9 in the morning. There was also a rule that they were under no circumstances allowed to toss petitions into his coach. Obviously, it must have happened before. While ordinary people had to ask for favors, those who participated in the organization of a visit, be it as soldiers, members of a convoy or the guard, or as members of delegations and deputies of various social ranks, ethnic groups and regions, usually received some handouts, decorations and medals, to distinguish and thank them, or simply to commemorate the event. And this was always a huge operation at the end of a visit to the archive, full with uh, this lists and, and, and correspondences on this. Already during the visit of Nicholas I, Long lists were drawn up of people receiving a variety of distinctions. Major decorations, like the St. Andrew Cross, were reserved for leading officers and the high nobility, while ordinary soldiers who had participated in the parades received one ruble each, as well as a pound of meat and a jug of wine. 
Civilian participants in the visit got commemorative medals. The list of recipients of these medals included, for example, 46 brave Tushetians, <coughs> who, after being told by the local police to don their best national costume, had been granted permission to come to Tiflis from this extremely remote mountain region. I don't know if anybody has been to Tusheti, but going there even today is a big challenge. So this is how this medal looks like. The silver medal, which they received, which had this portrait of Nicholas on one side and a text of Kafka's 1837 on the other one. And almost exactly the same uh, coin was minted by a commemoration of the visit of Alexander II. Now, apart from rewards providing individual uh, souvenirs of an event, all kinds of myths and stories related to Tsarist visits entered the realm of official memory and popular folklore after the departure of the august visitors. And oftentimes this lived on for decades. For example, the coach of Nicholas I overturned at high speed as he was driving out from Tiflis a <coughs> steep turn near the Vare River, which is the hero square in Tbilisi today. Nicholas was able to jump out just in time and remained unheard. This was quickly interpreted as a sign from God, but also as proof of the Tsar's vigor and physical strength. Viceroy Vorontsov had a cross erected at the location, you see that here, some years later, commemorating the miracle, which became part of the official welcoming ceremony when Alexander II visited in 1871. He stopped his coach at the memorial and crossed himself. And at this point, the head of the city welcomed him with a reference to the miraculous uh, salvation of his father and offered him bread and so on a golden plate. And then from that cross, uh, the Tsar proceeded to the Sioni Cathedral, to the official welcoming place, with the Hamkari lining the streets all the way into the city center. Now, while this Vienna cross was obviously a very public reminder of Nicholas's journey and his miraculous salvation through divine intervention, visible to anyone traveling in or out of town on the Georgian military highway, the story of his arrival in Gelenchik was no less dramatic. According to contemporary reports, Nicholas arrived during a storm and had to struggle against high waves when he was ferrying across to the beach. This scene was immortalized in a painting by Russia's most famous marine artist, Ivan Albazovsky, which you can see here. It became, this painting became one of the main attractions in the Military History Museum, also known as Karmslavo, the Temple of Fame, uh, which officially opened in Tiflis in February 1907. As we have seen, Tsars came to the Caucasus for a variety of reasons. They were showing off their might and magnificence, and indeed their divine powers to the surrounding empires and to their new subjects. Moreover, they marked a territory which they had acquired not that long ago, and they were also curious personally to learn more about the space. Their visits demonstrated the consolidation of the empire in the region, since it had to be safe or sufficiently safe for a time to travel. As in Russia proper, part of the visit was a projection of the union between Tsar and people through various representational means, the heavenly protection which the Tsar enjoyed, the harmonious relationship between the monarchy and the Orthodox Church, and the prowess of Russian arms. Aspects that markedly differed from trips within Russia proper included a fusion of styles and a mixture of cultural traditions. The visit of the Caucasus allowed for an impressive visual display of what Jane Bourbon and Fred Cooper have described as empire of difference. It clearly was the ethnic and cultural diversity of the region rather than assimilation or straightforward Russification that primarily shaped the imperial scenario in the southern borderlands. Furthermore, the widespread use of Eastern aesthetics and the inclusion of local folklore show that Russia was actually creating its own orient in the Caucasus, thereby presenting itself as equal to major Western colonial powers such as Britain and France. And finally, the visits of the Tsars were also a prominent part of <coughs> Russia's mission civilisatrice in the region, which was marked by the foundation of theaters, libraries, schools, hospitals, museums, and so on. When a Tsar came to these modern establishments, he elevated their status and gave them the imperial seal of approval. But he also took part in something of a tautological affair, that is, the highest representative of the empire visits institutions which represent the empire. This was in many ways a purely performative act, inscribing the Tsar into a wider scenario of civilizational progress. 
Just like doing the other functions of his trip, he became part of a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, a show which might be called the Benevolent and Enlightened Tsar in the Caucasus. Now this show is coming to an end now. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed some of it. And I thank you very much for your attention. That's difficult to say. I mean, they had, of course, they had palaces there. I mean, Gojumi, Hikami, that's where they were going to, to, to go on summer break anyway. And uh, I mean, when they spent their summers in Crimea, that wasn't that far away. So it was easy to walk over. Um, uh, so it wasn't that much local pressure groups that made it over there. It was just part of their annual peregrinating life, going to Crimea, going to the Caucasus. Um, Although, in some cases, of course, it was also uh, meant to, uh, as in the case of Nicholas, or Nicholas, both Nicholas I and Nicholas II, it was a clear political statement at that time. And in, in the case of Nicholas II, in particular, uh, where he came to the region as a clear statement against the Ottoman Empire, uh, we know that because there was hardly any preparation done for that trip. So all the, all the, uh, the kind of features that we have with other trips, they were there, but in a rather reduced form. They just didn't have time to prepare. Indeed, I mean, some of the photographs of the triumphal arches which they put up in Tiflis, uh, they just finished the day before the Tsar came, setting up these, these, these arches, because they just didn't have enough time to prepare. So in that case, it was a clear political statement. But usually it was just sort of an extension of the, of the summary sojourn in Turkey from here. And I have not come across a visit that, that happened in the summer, it's just too hot. Yeah, um, you mentioned that surrounding states were invited to send representatives. But were any of the European powers invited to come along, sending their ambassadors, in order to make an impression on them? The, the sort of the diplomats that were based around Tiflis, I mean, there were some consulates there. And they usually attended all that. Although, uh, in the case of uh, Nicholas II, because this was wartime, uh, the security measures were such that even the diplomats had to get permission to, to, to go to the church to see the Tsar. Yeah. So there are, there are documents in the archives that the, the Swiss and the French constantly the Tiflis had to get permission to go there. So everyone was uh, made sure that they didn't have any, any kind of sinister motifs. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, I mean it was, and of course it was written about in the newspapers and you could read, even Nicholas I was already, the British press had reports about it. Alexander III, as well. Uh, so there were reports about, and then there were these observers, like this Koch that I mentioned in 1837. There was another observer, a, an, an English captain, Wilbraham, who had been based in Tehran, but then after this, after the war had been sort of expelled and was based in Tiflis for a while. He um, <coughs> just was there accidentally, but he left descriptions of the events, which is good for us. Yeah, thank you. I have more like so sort of comment or suggestion. We know that uh, when uh, Alexander III visited uh, Baku, uh, I think it was 1887, there was a, after that, there was cathedral built, Alexander Nevsky cathedral built in the city, and also uh, Riverside uh, was named, actually was a mistake, erroneously named in honor of Alexander II, and then later on they started adding the third, like uh, the third uh, means, uh, one, it's the third card, it's the third line mm -hmm. to one, in, in Latin, you know, that one, two, three. They were really desperate in the line to, to, to change it, you know. Do you know the story? I, know, I, don't, I don't know that story, but the, the problem with Baku, with the Baku visit was that, uh, like in <coughs> other cities, I mean, this was also a, a jockeying for who, who has the best decorations. Uh, for example, in Kutaisi, they were sort of embarrassed that they couldn't pull on such a great show as they did in Baku, or in Batu, I mean, Batu is just, the location is just amazing. Uh, so we poor people in Kutais, we don't have that, but we are true and loyal followers of him. Yeah. So that was the best they could do. Uh, in Baku, there was a major storm the day before the arrival of the Tsar, so they couldn't put up all these arches and, and things. 
so it was another quick job, simply. Uh, but once it was there, I mean, he actually, the Baku visit was, was quite successful because <coughs> there he had this kind of fusion of this kind of ancient tradition of the Tsar visiting someone with modernity because he visited all the oil installations. He went to the Nobel families, the, the, the oil refineries. And finally, there, it's, it's this kind of fusion of old tradition with the triumphal arch, but then one of the triumphal arches was actually made out of machinery. It's like a like 1920s Soviet um, oil equipment that built the triumphal arch. Okay? Um, the Nobel family were the most entrepreneurial probably on the planet at that time. Uh, they presented themselves as humble servants of the Tsar. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely amazing, this kind of clash of different traditions there. Um, so there's a lot to, to read into this kind of uh, uh, customs that, that were still played out all the way uh, to 1914 when Nicholas came. Yeah. Uh, questions. One of them is, um, uh, to what degree this uh, division of the ball between the sort of European section and European dancing and then the, the, the local dancing, um, when the Tsar wasn't there to watch, um, what did the balls look like, like the general, general governor's ball or some of the, one of the big ones without the Tsar present? So I'm kind of wondering if, if that was something that was expected and they performed it and they sort of self-orientalized for the Tsar because that's what they thought they needed to do and whether that was a sort of pattern that appeared elsewhere in the empire as well. Uh, where there would be kind of the Tsar's people would go and say, well, we want to do European at first, and then we want to go local later. Um, and then the, the second question is, is also kind of compared it to other parts of the empire, and I'm wondering, because I'm thinking if, if the Tsar went to uh, Tallinn or, um, or to Riga, um, uh, there would have been a huge politics of whether he visited the, the Russian Orthodox Church under the Nicholas after it was built. Um, and I wonder if that ever came up in the visits to the Caucasus of the politics of visiting something that was specifically Russian and had a sort of mission to uh, to spread specifically Russian Russifying kind of themes in the Caucasus. I mean, with what went on after the war came to an end, or rather when the Tsar had left, the, the descriptions are not that widespread because I mean the, the, the correspondence left with the Tsar. In the newspaper people they wouldn't hang out much longer because the important thing was what the Tsar did. But all the references to what happened afterwards tend to show that they parted all the way, well, what they do in Georgia to this day. <laughs> it just didn't stop until there was no more to drink. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, I meant like a ball where bizarre, not just a normal ball when the Tsar wasn't invited. Uh, but it was kind of yeah. That was usually, yeah. usually yeah. European style, yeah. Um, because that is the, what one aspired to. But again, mixed. I mean, both was possible. It's a, this is kind of a strange situation that, um, in, a, in a way, we are sort of trained by, by, by Lockman that this is kind of binary thing, okay, that they play something. But uh, as uh, Michel Marais of course, in the article, this is actually not the case anywhere. And in the Georgian case, it's definitely not the case anymore. And these, these guys were really operating in several cultural registers. And they played with it, they, they were aware of it. I mean, many of them had been to Petersburg or were actually officers in there. Russian army, so they, they, they knew both roads. Um, now, with regard to the second question, you, you're referring to Malte Roth's work on, on the visit of Nicholas in Warsaw, for example, uh, where there was much more political contention. But it was also, I mean, fact is that in the West, the Russian Empire was up against a completely different uh, cultural setting, whereas in the Caucasus, I mean, Tiflis had been destroyed by the Persians in 1795, there was nothing there. So the Tabula Raza was literally Tabula Raza, and they could build it from scratch. Um, and the local traditions uh, were not uh, that developing when it came to this kind of secular world. I mean, of course, it was church tradition, but uh, here there was a lot to export without hitting any kind of wall. Um, so it was absorbed much more than, than in the Western borderlands. Where, I mean, also, of course, we, we know that kind of fascination with the Caucasus in Russia, which has this kind of strange uh, aspect to it. On one hand, they were fascinated about it, but on the other hand, there was also this sort of inferiority complex among Russians who are coming to this kind of ancient cultures, uh, which is something which, uh, of course, uh, is peculiar to that region, which they didn't have in Poland or, or in Eastern Russia, to that extent, or Finland. So, uh, in a way, uh, uh, the way Pushkin described this in his journey to Azum is, is very telling. Suddenly, this was a different world. 
So I've been struggling to put what you've presented into what we know from Wharton's scenarios of power, which is the work on Tsarist ceremonial symbolism. And you mentioned Wharton a couple of times, in part criticizing him for this uh, about the overly mad Russian national depiction of Alexander III's visit. And in Wartman, each czar has a scenario, but then there are these underlying, I think he calls them myths, right, that last for much longer. And the European myth comes to an end with Alexander III, and the so-called Russian myth begins. And it seems to me one interpretation of what you might be saying is that there was a kind of um, imperial myth constantly throughout the 19th century about enlightenment, cultivating um, you know, the whole garden motif and so forth, which seemed to have continued all along. Um, but I'm wondering if, in fact, the other, you might be modifying him more fundamentally by what you said about hybridity and the various registers. Couldn't there have been a kind of Russian national emphasis in the heartland, starting with Alexander Allah Wartman, but then these other celebrations of diversity in the borderlands at the same time as simply different registers. Um, and so that seems to me a perfectly plausible interpretation of what you're saying. And especially since in <coughs> Russian nationalism, there's also this notion that Russian imperialism is softer and kinder than the European variation. Well, I mean, Woodman, of course, actually admitted that too. I mean, he did not work on, on borderlands. Uh, that's what made this interesting to me, to just check his findings against what we actually have there. And especially in a, in a borderland that is relatively recent and sort of underdeveloped, I mean, right? um, So in a sense, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that he's wrong. In it. it's, it's sort of fundamental criticism. It's just an, an addition which actually shows that he said that was much more complex. Uh, and of course, if you take Paul Cruz's work on religions, it's, it's also I mean, the different religions. I mean, the Muslim religion being a building block of the empire, uh, it's not part of the official scenario, but here in the borderlands it is, simply because they are there. And it makes a lot of sense to include them. Plus, of course, you can also draw on, and this is what makes it important to look at these aesthetic manifestations. You can also look at what the, the British do, what the French do, or don't do. Uh, and uh, so this kind of pride in the kind of ethnic uh, plurality is something which, which definitely comes through in these visual depictions, um, which I'm trying to, to show. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one is something that I heard when I was in uh, Tbilisi doing research. I'm wondering whether you heard it. Um, you know, the Georgian nobility was, um, was becoming quite impoverished. In the, at least in the, the second half of the 19th century, having to sell a lot of land to Armenians and so on. And I, I was told, by, I don't think it was a joke, but I was told that some of these people um, kind of, uh, they blamed it on the Russian administrators that they were, they were squandering all their money on these balls and things. Not specifically the Tsar's visits, but the ones that like Baron Silva's thrilling and so on. So there was this sort of underside of it. Yeah, they could uh, participate in a, a sort of Russian style and these things, but um, it took its toll on them. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to ask is about, actually about the Armenians, because uh, you really, uh, throughout, you, you stressed the Georgian nobility, <coughs> but we know that in, in Tiflis, um, the Armenian bourgeoisie was, was a very uh, prominent and large part of the population, and they didn't get along all that well with the, the Georgians. And then the Russian government uh, developed a kind of a hostility to the Armenian entrepreneurs too. But you know, it's, traditionally, when Tsars and other, not just Tsars, but other important people visit a town in, in, in Russia, anywhere, it's the merchants who kind of do the, the the bread and salt thing. They are often they often have kind of a special role in these ceremonies. And I'm wondering, um, did you come into? And I think this gets at what Harley was asking about the sort of the politics of how uh, you know there are different 
competing elites in, in not just in Tiflis, but in, in any of these towns. And uh, you make it sound as if uh, you know, everything was just you know, it prepared according, you know, according to this very uh, you know, uh, coherent plan. And it, everything went off without a hitch and so on. But I think there were, um, there, there were <coughs> some rivalries. Of course, I mean, this is, this is something I, mean, I had to reduce massively. I mean, in the, in the book, there will be lots of exactly these kind of issues. Uh, I mean, the, the jostling for positions at the board is just one uh, uh, expression of this phenomenon, which was uh, widespread when it came to the preparations. And you read the correspondences between the different stakeholders in these visits. It's amazing what they propose and whom they want to. So you have found the correspondence? Yes, of course, yes. Yeah. And of course, it's the Armenian versions, in particular, I mean, they were the running the city, uh, who were providing a lot of cash for the visits as well. Well, by the late. I, I mean, I just I picked the boards because they are very symbolic in a sense. Uh, but uh, there were instances when uh, there was Alexander II, when he visited us, that the city, i.e. the Armenians, uh, had borrowed all the available wash basins, tables, and chairs. So when the Tsar had, when, or when the, when the, when the Tsarist officials tried to get these kind of practical things uh, to be provided for a changing of the costumes for travel here to, to the parade uniforms in a special building outside the Tiflis, they had difficulties finding them because the city had already been first. Uh, so these kind of practical things that are played out, especially uh, when it comes to, to these different uh, ethnic uh, groups. The impoverished nobility, of course, it's, it's always there. That's why the Chelokhaev, the lady was mortgaging a, uh, taking a loan out of the house yeah. <laughs> to, get, to get a proper dress. Uh, there were lots of these instances. I mean, did they, did they do it under duress? Or did, was it a, no, no, this was, was you wanted to go. I mean, this was, I mean, Weidenbaum was in a, in a fantastic position, the source where I got this from, because he actually knows all these people. Tiflis is a small place, and you see the same name popping up year after year, decade after decade. Uh, the same guys who worked to make some kind of dummies for the Caucasian Museum also made a Pushkin statue somewhere else. I mean, it's all the same folks. And, um, they know each other, they know their, their weaknesses, they know their, their affairs, everything, okay? And then when you read a diary of one of them, uh, that's where these, these stories come out. So there's a lot, a lot of these kind of uh, uh, difficult things. Indeed, when I talk about petitioning, um, official, uh, regular people had to, to, to stick to the rules and, and, and hand in the petition fidei in mind, um, in the Alexander III case, but uh, the then uh, civil governor of of Tiflis, Donald of Gorsakov, actually handed in his petition at the dinner, the, 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 the one dinner that I had described, where actually he took advantage of him being close to the Tsar. Mm -hmm. And he told the Tsar about the dire situation of the Georgian nobility and what can be done about it. <laughs> so I don't know the result, I don't know what Alexander answered, but it was exactly what he described that this was actually even translated.